The story of Solaris reflects the duality of mankind. It is both a planet of profound achievement and the reflection of our worst vices. It is a planet where fortunes can be made and billionaires can be rendered into paupers overnight. It's a planet where people can achieve their destinies and also be snuffed out without so much as a police report. But before we get to all that, we need to sort out our setting and how it became the center of so many things fun and debaucherous. The seventh planet in the Solaris system was settled by 2271, and by 2571, the system had been incorporated into the growing Free Worlds League. It was seen as a good prospect for development, as it had a breathable atmosphere and a surface gravity of just 10% greater than Terra. Oceans covered 80% of the planet's surface and were populated by a variety of native fish species. The system's K1V star is a medium main sequence that is stable, which is always good when you don't want your planet sterilized by bursts of radiation. There are two major continents, Greyland and Equitus, but only Greyland was extensively settled and developed early on. The soil was rich and much of the land was covered with conifer-like trees up to a taiga in the north and slowly becoming grasslands in the southern reaches. Described as somewhat chilly and rainy, Solaris 7 would not have been a vacation destination if not for its later man-made recreational activities. Development on Equitus, the other continent, was limited to scattered mining and logging ventures. It was those mineral deposits which brought the first major industries to Solaris 7. This included several different battle mech manufacturing lines. Somewhere along that early timeline, people noticed that the wide variety of different terrain on the planet made for good mech testing grounds, and this led to even more interest from mech producers. Blue Shot Weapons was one of those producers which earned a reputation for pitting its prototype designs against each other in order to prove their metal. These bouts, likely very controlled and limited to keep the mech warrior safe, were the first fights between mechs on Solaris. With production lines came employees and small settlements soon grew together into larger communities over the top of underground industrial sites. An extensive network of tunnels and storage facilities were bored out of the bedrock underneath what would end up being called Solaris City. In 2695, the first recorded fight between battle mechs of different manufacturers was held. Orgus and Defiance Industries were each vying for a lucrative SLDF contract and the match between the two options seemed like a great way to demonstrate one was superior to the other. Orgus's new 45-ton Phoenix Hawk was sent out to face Defiance's 40-ton Sentinel, and by the time the Phoenix Hawk managed to clench the victory, many in the audience knew they had stumbled upon an opportunity for more than just corporate bragging rights. Video recordings of the fight were distributed by Orgus, which was keen on showing off what their product was capable of, and bootleg copies spread far and wide. Savvy entrepreneurs jumped at the opportunity to recreate the moment as the public, on and off world, craved more fight footage. By the end of 2695, there had been several more staged battles, all well recorded and edited for the best angles of the big stompy carnage. At first, fights tended to be sponsored by the manufacturers of the mechs involved in each event, though quickly demand outpaced supply and independent matches began to spring up around the region. On the game world, people lived and died by their reputations. Fixed fights were rarer these days, but not unknown, especially when a mech warrior was vulnerable. These guys sent blood from a kilometer away. The system that developed on Solaris 7 was influenced by the planet's relatively open status as an industrial hub. Though sections of the city were initially largely sympathetic to Lyran or Merrick political allegiances, the number of factions grew to represent each of the great inner sphere houses. Though the planet itself was within the Free Worlds League territory before the First Succession War, it essentially operated as an open planet for any and all to arrive with dreams of glory or great wealth, and eventually leave with empty pockets. Overspecialization is for bugs, Brandon said sharply. I know this is Solaris, I get it, I know the people want to show. I know every contender needs a hook. Every pilot wants to be a champion. Every crowd wants to be razzled and or dazzled with something new every goddamn fight. What was lovingly called the Solaris Circuit was actually more than a hundred different arenas spread across the planet's two continents. Fights could range from single combat between two fighters wearing as little as industrial exoskeletons to teams of mech warriors fighting across large battlefields of hundreds of meters. They were categorized in one of six classes. 
The Class 1 fights were the smallest scale, and generally just one-on-one -on -one fights in light augmentation or battle armor. As you progressed up in the classes, if you chose, the risk and possible reward increased. The Class 5 and 6 arenas tended to be within Solaris City itself, and featured heavy and assault battle mechs. Each of the zones of the city corresponding with loyalty to a great house owned and maintained an arena deliberately distinct from the others. For example, the factory was a famous arena which was built within the Free Worlds League sector of Montenegro. Originally a vast industrial complex, the factory was built at such a large scale that battle mechs could move freely between the massive machines and support pylons. There were even elevators large enough for battle mechs to move from one floor to the next, intensifying the feeling of being lost within a never-ending labyrinth of industrial metal. In what would become a theme among most of the large arenas, the environment in which the combatants fought could be as much of a factor as a mech warrior's skill. Within the Capellan Confederation sector, Cathay, the most famous arena was known as the Jungle. Originally intended as a vast natural area along with a Buddhist temple, Changing plans resulted in an incomplete temple and a retrofitting of the area to be a densely forested arena for battle mech combat. The Capellan state spared no expense in creating what they hoped would be considered a premier location which would shame the other houses on Solaris. Though at a glance it would look like a natural space, the topography and plant cover was routinely changed by a vast army of workers to create a new experience for the viewers and to prevent mech warriors from memorizing the battlefield's quirks. A buried command bunker within the arena's floor was even equipped to create artificial rainstorms from overhead pipework to add yet another complicating factor to a fight. Among the elite class 5 and 6 mech warriors on Solaris 7, the ultimate goal was to participate and possibly win the yearly grand tournament. The 128 open slots for entrance in the tournament were themselves prized and there was an intense competition in matches just to be entered into one of them. The tournament itself was single elimination with significant cash and prestige prizes as you defeated your competitors. The overall winner would hold the distinction as champion of Solaris for the year. The win also included a large cash prize as well as access to the most prestigious areas of the city where top contracts and social connections could be forged. Of course, for every big name fight that made the Holovids distributed far and wide, there were dozens or even hundreds of other bouts in smaller venues where cash prizes might be earned. As much as Solaris City is referred to as the jewel of the inner sphere, it also had a rougher and more dangerous side to it. Mech warriors and gladiators could find themselves a victim of circumstance or rotten luck, locked into unfavorable contracts with a stable that kept most of their earnings while the fighter takes all the risk. In the darkness and shadows further away from the center of the city, dreams could die unceremoniously. Organized crime, destitution, and desperate acts of survival were common across what was known as the Reaches of Solaris. Just as in places like Las Vegas back in the 20th and 21st centuries on Terra, what showed up in the media wasn't the complete picture of how many people lived on Solaris. Still, that grittier existence appealed to some, and a few of the larger arenas within the Reaches became quite popular among residents of the city that could not afford tickets to the more prestigious venues. There was a certain appeal to seeing the jury-rigged Frankenmechs which often showed up in colorful paint jobs and sporting spikes and blunt force weapons which drew a consistent crowd. First thing I thought was, God, but I've fallen a long way. Just a few short months ago, I'd been on top of the world, a leading class 4 mech jock with success written all over me. Only a matter of time, I thought. Only a matter of time before I'm slugging away with the big boys in class 5 arenas. But then I blew it big time. Wasted a top-of-the-line victor on some cheap DOA fracker. I lost my ride with Unthrax and had to take representation with some cheap Zolaran stable whose name I could barely remember. And here I was, in a cheap blood pit on the edge of the river bend, a logging town that didn't even show up on maps. Some of those who became Grand Champion of Solaris would become well-known across the inner sphere and even into the periphery. Names like Kai Allard Liao and Win Goddard and Grey Noten would become household names. However, there are many others who had interesting paths to victory. For example, the O'Bannon sisters, Elizabeth and Tanya, had dreams of victory in the Grand Tournament. In the 3040s, they hoped to invest their winnings into the creation of their own stable where they could then bring up new mech warriors and keep the venture going for decades. Each of them was successful in lower class fights. 
However, they always resisted the offers to fight against each other in a sibling bout. When they each entered the grand tournament in 3051, they were seated on opposite ends of the brackets, far from each other. But as more and more entrants were eliminated, the fans of the event realized that if Elizabeth and Tanya were each undefeated, they would be pitted against each other in the championship fight. With tensions high and millions of Seabells bet on one or the other, the sisters agreed to a draw. For that year, they would share the title of Grand Champion. Of course, most mech warriors and gladiators would never reach that height of success, but the dream was real and many did make a decent living as entertainers of the masses craving action. Some stability could be found in finding a contract with the stable, which were organizations created to support warriors with a sense of community, teamwork, and even sharing resources like battle mechs. All of this was provided for a cut of the earnings, of course. Some stables were more predatory than others, but overall they were seen as a positive way for aspiring champions to get their foot in the door. Well-known stables often developed the social connections to obtain the best contracts for bouts in the most profitable locations in the city. Located near the border between the Lyran Commonwealth and the Free Worlds League, the Solaris system was inevitably going to be impacted by the collapse of the Star League and the First Succession War. At that point, the planet was still largely industrialized for the purposes of mech production and testing. While technically a Free Worlds League planet, it was essentially run independently by the corporations that made up a majority of the control over production lines on the planet itself. When House Steiner moved to gobble up the surrounding systems, the powers that be on Solaris looked at their bottom line and decided that joining the Lyran Alliance would be the most profitable path forward. Without pomp, circumstance, or even a landing invasion force, Solaris 7 declared its loyalty to the Lyrans. Unfortunately, House Merrick did not take the loss of such a profitable and important planet well and launched a retaliatory raid that included the extensive use of nuclear weapons. Though none of them fell on Solaris City itself, wide swaths of land on both major continents was scarred and irradiated for decades. Instead of making the people of Solaris regret their decision to join with the Lyrans, it only cemented their resolve in what had been a purely economic and pragmatic decision before. There was some tension among the regions of Solaris City, though this wasn't a new phenomena as during the 28th century the city had dealt with the hostility stemming from the Hidden War, which was in many ways a preview for the First Succession War. Thankfully for the citizens of Solaris 7, the planet was treated very lightly by the Lyrans who didn't seek to change or influence what had been long seen as a fairly neutral territory for the Great Houses. During the First Succession War, the city saw a considerable amount of construction and a formal designation of city sectors for each of the Great Houses over what had been a largely informal and blurry designation before. Gladiatorial matches took on an additional importance as they often reflected real-world battles taking place across the Inner Sphere. It's impossible to get a complete picture of what Solaris 7 is without talking about the machines and technology that the modern day gladiators use to pummel each other into submission and entertain the cheering crowds. Everything from souped up battle armor to entirely unique battle mech designs were needed to fill those arenas and make sure the spectators didn't get bored of the same old thing. While there were plenty of standard battle mechs in all makes and models including eventually clan mechs, Many more were Franken mechs that were tweaked to fill the needs and styles of the mech warriors that used them. While not always optimized for the battlefield, they could be quite deadly in the arenas. The WRW LF001 Werewolf is an interesting example of a Solaris gladiatorial mech because it wasn't just a one of a kind beast. It was produced for sale both on and off world by O'Neill's battle mechs of Solaris starting in 3056. While it did have trouble finding those off-world sales, several Solaris stables purchased the design for use by their mech warriors. Weighing in at 40 tons and built around a Nissan 200XL engine, the Werewolf was not a low-tech Frankenmech. With a top speed of 86.4 km per hour and three Rawlings 75 jump jets, the Werewolf could boast about its impressive movement profile. It also sported 16 double heat sinks and 9 tons of standard plate armor. The Werewolf was intended to be a short-range brawler, as its longest-range weapon was a short-range Missile 6 rack installed in the right arm. Backing it up in the left arm was a medium pulse laser. At extremely close range, a pair of small pulse lasers split between the side torsos added additional accurate fire. Finally, the most entertaining weapons of the bunch were a pair of machine guns located in the head and center torso. While this short-range dedicated design struggled outside of Solaris, 
it proved popular with several mech warriors who completed in the lower ranges of the medium mech class. It is extremely oversynced to the point that even if the 16 heat sinks were standard instead of doubles, it would still be tough to overheat the werewolf. However, in fights that took place in high temperature environments, it would have no problem operating while its opponents might struggle. The independent contender, Itsura Mikasai, won consistently with a werewolf he named Bloodhound, and several other stables made their own modifications to improve the armor and to tweak it to their needs. Overall, the werewolf stands is a good example of how mechs were tailored to the desires of the screaming crowds. Leaping down the timeline a bit to 3077, a great example of a Solaris Frankenmech was the aptly nicknamed the Lich, which was based on a Warhammer chassis. Showing up on Solaris with a shocking debut win decisively in a match against a 90-ton Highlander, Francis Indigo was an instant rising star. An investigation by reporters discovered the Warhammer benefited from a significant number of expensive and high-tech upgrades which explained, at least partially, why it was so successful. Utilizing Endosteel, a 280 light fusion engine which had been armored, a heavy-duty gyro and an armored cockpit, the Lich was strong and difficult to take down. 12.5 tons of light ferrofibrous armor provided 212 points of protection, which was roughly the same level of protection as the Warhammer 8D the mech was based on, but at a ton less mass. Strangely, the legs of the mech were traced back to a Clan Novacat battle mech, as apparently they were renowned for being stable platforms for fire. The investigator discovered that the arms of the mech were actually sourced from a Marauder chassis, but the ER PPCs had been replaced with snub-nosed PPCs instead. Each of them was paired with a PPC capacitor, which made each of the energy weapons more powerful at the cost of five additional heat. Four ER medium lasers were spread across the mech's side torsos and arms. Finally, a Clan Tech SRM-6 sat high on the right torso, offering an unwelcome hug should an opponent wander too close. Not leaving anything to chance, the ammunition for the SRM-6 was given Case 2 to prevent any unpleasant deaths by ammo explosion. With the addition of armored sensors, it seemed like there wasn't a single aspect of the Lich which wasn't reinforced to the point of near absurdity to keep it in the fight for longer. 13 double heat sinks are the mech's weakest point, being only able to bleed away a portion of the heat that would be generated if the Lich fired all of its weapons and even just the two snub-nosed PPCs with their capacitors charged. However, if the mech wearer holds off on those PPCs until the mech is within close range, relying upon the ER medium lasers, heat management wouldn't be too scary. Getting in close enough for a kill shot, a one-time big spike in heat might be worth it if the opposing mech is disabled by it. A possible 62 damage alpha strike would likely make that happen more often than not. There were rumors that the Lich was actually a prototype design from StarCore Industries which produces the Warhammer 8D, but officially the company denied any connection to this mech. However, observers of the team did push the theory that the supervising technician, the Farouk Gauda, looks suspiciously like Dr. Samir Rajapalani, an employee at StarCore and the designer of the light Gauss Warhammer 8M. Interesting. Following the whole planet covered in nuclear detonations thing early on, Solaris 7 weathered the succession wars rather well and continued to build and develop the planet's economy. There were times of great profit and recessions as the tastes shifted over the years and decades of warfare took their toll. However, it's said that the Succession Wars also produced plenty of good entertainment as experienced mech warriors fresh out of house militaries often headed to Solaris in search of fame, fortune, or just one more chance to seek glory in the cockpit of a battle mech. With the end of the Fourth Succession War and the union between House Davion and House Steiner, most residents of the Inner Sphere could be forgiven for thinking there might be hope for a lasting peace, or even an eventual return to a unified Star League. Some even theorized that in good time, Solaris might end up being the last place where mech combat could be seen within the Inner Sphere. Of course, we know now this would not be how things would turn out for anyone. The arrival of the clans caused a shockwave through the Inner Sphere in 3049, and the response among the residents of Solaris 7 was completely unhinged. A wave of panic and cataclysmic dread led people to make foolish and grand gestures with their cash to go out on a high note. One last fight, one last fling, even one last big bet on a mech match. It seemed everyone was eager to risk it all. Bookies and providers of various vices reaped in massive profits as visitors flooded the planet with even more stories of impending doom for the Federated Commonwealth, Draconis Combine, and the poor decimated Free Rosselhog Republic. 
Following Comstar's victory at Tukiad, the bill came due for many who hadn't already burned out from the previous couple of years, and Solaris went into a deep recession. Corporations, stables, and even organized crime organizations collapsed as the tourism and betting on matches dried up. By that point, battle ROM footage from countless battles against the clans had flooded the market for exporting mech carnage and that source of entertainment revenue saw a deep decline in profitability. The economic woes were only turned around by the mech warriors of Solaris themselves, who started to self-promote and in turn were promoted by others. A fight between two battle mechs might be considered boring, but a fight between Kai Allard Liao and Jason Block could grab their attention. While making mech warriors famous names was not a new tactic, for example, Grey Noten from a generation before, the scale at which the Solaris machine could create the equivalent of a personality cult behind these warriors brought everything up to a new level. Of course, we also have to recognize the impact that superstar announcers like Duncan Fisher had on the matches as well. With attention-grabbing mechs, mech warriors with powerful personalities, and enough special effects and razzle-dazzle to single-handedly fund a confetti factory, Solaris crawled back into economic good times. Even some in the clans who were initially very hostile toward the idea of fighting for money or fame eventually began to see the appeal of Solaris matches. Having heard Solaris 7 disparaged by many clan warriors, trueborn and proud, I admit being disinclined to think well of the world. Mech combat fought as entertainment for the lower castes. Merchants telling warriors who will fight. Warriors accepting money and having to sell their services to maintain their machines. It all seemed too alien, not of the clans. But then again, the entirety of the inner sphere is not of the clans, nor is it ever likely to be despite our dreams of conquest. I do not deny my heritage or the call to glory that still pulls me toward Terra like metal to a lodestone. But I've been to Solaris 7, which I think is more than most can say who continue to look upon it as a world of degenerates. How can anyone gainsay Kai Alad Liao, who for a time called Solaris 7 his home, as being anything but a warrior whether born true or free? I've seen incredible battles fought in the Solaris arenas. They challenge for prominence, for station, and match themselves as well as they are able so that the better warrior may emerge the victor. In this, I see something very noble in Solaris 7, and many of the warriors who call it home. Something familiar. What is our circle of equals, if not an arena? Business on Solaris 7 continued to be good throughout the late 3050s and early 3060s, though the collapse of the Federated Commonwealth did bring plenty of drama and more than a few conflicts in bars and streets of Solaris City. In August of 3062, a widely promoted championship bout between Victor Vandergriff and Michael Searcy resulted in chaos when their Lyran vs. Davion bout spilled into the stands following a glitch in the safety systems that normally protect spectators. When their two mechs spilled out into the streets, fans from both sides rioted and soon the whole city was in an uproar. It took the arrival of a Lyran Armed Forces unit from off-world to finally bring an unsteady peace back to the world as the rest of the Federated Commonwealth burned. The first bout, a wash, Vandergriff and Circe would meet again in another arranged fight and ended up killing each other, which seems like a good description of how civil wars tend to go. In June of 3068, the word of Blake Kerfuffle arrived at the shores of Solaris with an invasion by the 18th and 25th Division of Blakist forces. It was uncontested as the typical Comguard presence on Solaris had been removed. The defense of the planet was left to the large stables and individual mech warriors who called the planet home. Though many fought valiantly against the Blakists, they were pretty quickly overwhelmed. The fact that several of the House Merrick-aligned stables sided with the word of Blake and the mistaken assumption that the planet was being taken with intent to return it to the control of the Free Worlds League didn't help. Solaris City descended into rioting in almost every sector of the city as the presence of the Blakists allowed for all the barely contained animosity between the factions to boil over. The Blakist forces did nothing to bring peace and instead used the chaos to secure key control points and industrial objectives. Thankfully, not all hope was lost. Individual mech warriors, soldiers, and civilians began to organize a resistance movement under the leadership of Eric Gray, who was a young, talented mech warrior who had worked within the Silver Dragon's stable. Gathering resources and talented people, the movement was named the Solaris Home Defense League. 
Starting with small acts of sabotage and picking off vulnerable Blakists whenever possible, the SHDL built support from the residents of the city who might have had issues with each other but could set them aside for now under the threat of the word of Blake. In typical Solaris fashion, the attacks on the Blakists were recorded and broadcast across the planet's extensive media network that the word of Blake occupiers could never really fully control. The SHDL became local heroes even as the word of Blake sought to crush this homegrown rebellion with harsh tactics and public executions of captured SHDL personnel. In a well-known tactic, the Blakists attempted to use overwhelming force against Gray's forces, but the extensive collateral damage only galvanized the people against the word of Blake. By May of 3071, the Blakist control of Solaris City completely collapsed when the SHDL organized a strike on dozens of targets simultaneously. As the Blakists resorted to strafing the city with dropships in an attempt to stop the rebellion, Gray's units claimed huge stockpiles of weapons and battle mechs necessary to continue the fight. In a panic, the Blakists destroyed the HPG and temporarily abandoned Solaris City, though it would return when the SHDL fractured shortly after their victory. The fighting would continue into December of 3071 when the Word of Blake finally abandoned Solaris 7 entirely after it was clear that there was no value left in it. Millions of people had died and Solaris City was decimated by more than three years of fighting. With the Blakists gone, the SHDL quickly fell apart as the old rivalries resurfaced. Order and relative peace was established only after the arrival of Lyran military units in late 3074. In the years leading up to the final destruction of the Word of Blake, refugees flocked to Solaris even though the planet was still struggling to find its own footing. Wide swaths of Solaris City were in ruins and the industrial network which had previously produced a wide range of goods including battle mechs, was shattered. However, it still maintained potential for recovery. The Lyran Alliance identified Solaris as an important possession if the House had any hope of recovering their industrial potential following the widespread damage on Hesperus II. Therefore, when most of the Bolan province sought to join the Republic of the Sphere, the Lyrans insisted on retaining control of the Solaris system. Going by the available information, Solaris VII did recover economically in the years following the destruction of the Word of Blake. Never underestimate the desire of people to risk their hard-earned money on games of chance and marginal skill. Political machinations of both Lyran and Clan would end up changing the destiny for Solaris VII. The system was wrapped up in an offer by Archon Melissa Steiner to grant Clan Wolf a wide swath of territory to create a buffer state on the border with the Free Worlds League. Of course, this wouldn't quite work out for the Lyrans, but that's another story. In the redrawn map of the Inner Sphere in 3145, the Solaris system was firmly in the grasp of a newborn wolf empire. Solaris 7 had never been a stranger to spectacle. The game world had seen it all, from scrap heaps duking it out for the entertainment of logging camp yokels to elaborately produced elite duels and ultra-modern arenas, not to mention gang wars, the Solaris Home Defense League's anti-Blakist crusade, and the great urban mech uprising of 3122. But in all his years as a holovid operator on Solaris, Marco had never seen anything quite so… alien. Wolf Empire warriors filled the arena stands, each group in their own section down by the front just behind the detonator grid. Freshly painted names adorned the walls of the arena. Kerensky, Fetledral, Ward, and more. Nearly a hundred in all. What got to Marco wasn't their exotic leather uniforms or ceremonial masks. You'd see stranger things at Zelda's Palace of Scorn any given Tuesday but rather their expectant, almost reverent, silence. A sharp contrast to the raucous screaming of the typical audiences. Information on what sort of changes the wolves implemented on Solaris 7 is scant, but we do know that the games continued. In 3146, the Royal Fantasy Tournament was held and widely promoted, which suggests that life didn't drastically change on the planet. The tournament was notable as a considerable amount of effort was put in by the organizers and participants to theme the event around inspiring characters from classic fairy tales. For example, there was a phoenix hawk nicknamed Jasmine, and a gunsmith that went by Cinderella, of course. However, I think my favorite is the 40-ton calliope nicknamed Snow White, modified by Team Magic Mirror which sported a clan ERPPC along with a PPC capacitor. 
It also benefited from 10 Clan Double Eat Sinks, 9 tons of Clan Lamellar Armor, and a good set of secondary weapons that made finishing off a foe you just hit for 20 damage an easy chore. If this kind of wacky custom build for a mech really turns your dials, check out the XTRO Royal Fantasy. They're pretty wild. When the wolves packed up their toys and headed toward Terra on Alaric's Grand Crusade, the planets of the new wolf empire were suddenly a lot less supervised. Bereft of the clan oversight, rumblings of rebellion stirred on the streets of Solaris 7. People were still alive who remembered the fight against the Word of Blake, and the reasoning was, if they could kick out the Word of Blake, they could surely deal with the remnant forces that the wolves had left behind. On August 4th, 3151, an unidentified battle mech force conducted a raid which hit the Solaris City spaceport in earnest, sweeping aside the modest wolf security forces stationed there. When additional clan forces were called upon to respond, they found their path through the city blocked by battle mechs scattered along the way which slowed their progress. When the wolves did finally reach the spaceport, the raiders had already packed three jump ships with looted goods and launched from the planet. Though initially suspected to be a pirate action from outside the system, no jump ships were detected by clan sensors, and it was deemed much more likely that the dropships never actually left the atmosphere. To summarize it in a succinct way, the call came from inside the house. Just a moment, we're getting an update. Yes, we're receiving footage of additional battle mechs engaging clan wolf reinforcements. One of those mechs appears to be none other than the Keeper, a custom gravedigger piloted by Solaris' favorite Alicia Way. While we cannot confirm that it is Way herself with the controls of her mech, it appears that the arena fighters of Solaris are striking back at the clan force that has occupied the planet. Whether this is an isolated incident or the first step in a coordinated response to the occupation remains to be seen. News of the raid did escape the system and ended up being added to the growing pile of evidence that suggested that the Wolf Empire was not able to defend their territory. In a situation that mirrors the discovery of the cored out Jade Falcon occupation zone, it was just a matter of time before the Wolf Empire worlds were assimilated by their neighbors. The future of Solaris 7 may depend on how eager the Free Worlds League or even the Capellans are to claim the game world for themselves. Solaris's closer relative proximity to Terra does make it possible for Alaric's wolves to make a play to keep it, but the extent at which the new Ilkhan can project his power is in doubt. Solaris 7 is a fascinating planet, very much worth spending some time reading about if you have the time and access to some of the older source books. Of course, there are also the stories told in novels like Main Event, which add additional fluff and depth to the world. What we covered today is just a surface-level introduction, and there's still plenty more to learn. If you are interested, I included an exhaustive list of sources I used, and they can be a great jumping-off point for your own journey and adventures on Solaris 7. I know many of us are going to be playing the latest MechWarrior 5 DLC, which launches today, so keep in mind the old saying that life is cheap, but battle mechs aren't. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, hitting the like and subscribe button is the best way to do that, and it's almost painless. Taking that extra step to become a channel member directly funds the creation of this and future channel content. To those of you who have already taken that step, thank you. Now until we meet again, happy gaming and take care. Please go out and make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.